Go to the book of John, St. John, or the Gospel of John. We're in John, the first chapter. We begin a new series of studies on uh, Wednesday night on what I call the baptism of Jesus. Uh, there are four baptisms associated with Jesus. And um, these are really important to the church. And so um, I'm going to pick this, I'm going to pick it up in verse 19. And it uh, just depends how things go tonight. I'd probably, I'd probably like to do two studies on John's baptism of Jesus. But um, we'll see how that goes. Uh, and I'm going to try to run this series through the month of November. Uh, in verse 19, this is the witness. Maybe your Bible says testimony. Uh, testimony is good. Witness, it's, it's the word. It, actually, the Greek word is where you get the word martyr. That martyr comes from that word. Martyrera is the word. It, and uh, I want you to look at the word. Yeah, and they used it in mine. In verse 19, see the word witness? Verse 19. Our passage goes through verse 34. Now look at verse 34. In other words, it opens with the witness. It closes with it. Watch this. And I have seen and I bore witness. See that? In other words, this passage opens with the, uh, John's testimony, what he, what he witnesses to in verse 19, and what he concludes is now stated, what he has witnessed has become his testimony. And so sometimes that word can be used, testimony can be used, witness can be used a lot of different ways. Um, but my point is this passage, which is, John baptizing Jesus, it opens with, the, with this word and it closes with it. Do you see that? And it opens. This is the witness of John, right? This is the witness of John. Uh, John is the writer of this, without John the author of this. Uh, this is the witness of John, but what, he's refer what John is referring to is John the Baptist. Uh, this is the witness of John when the Jews sent to him priest and Levi, see? So it is John writing the book about what, who we call John the Baptist, the, this section, 19 through 34, and it is about what John witnessed has become his testimony. John the Baptist is what we're calling John here. And I just was saying, don't confuse that with the author of the book. This is the witness of John, and he's going to tell you this as it goes along. Uh, when the Jews, uh, and we're later going to see who that group were, sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? Now, what's going to be important is, you know, we we'll always look for markers, and you're going to find in from verse 19, to 25, you're going to find seven questions they have been sent to ask. Okay? And this group, you're going to, you're going to see in a moment, um, I was looking down at my paper. Um, <coughs> well, anyhow, I'll get to it in a moment. Oh, in verse 24, and they, that is the uh, priest and Levites, they had been sent from the Pharisees. See that? And when you glance through this, you will see that there are seven questions they've been sent 
Um, some have called this interrogating, but it really is not that. It's not that they haven't got to that place yet where they're interrogating, where, they've, where they're coming in with their guns loaded. They've come in with, with trying to figure out some information. And as we go through it, I'll try to help you understand what they're, but they, they're asking seven questions that are very important to them about what John is doing. What are you doing out here in the wilderness um, baptizing people? What, what's going on here? And so we'll see that. Who are you? They're going to ask. That's one question. Who are you? And he confessed. That's our word homologeo. That's in 1 John 1, 9. Uh, and he confessed, which is a good translation. <laughs> and he did not deny. And he confessed, I am not the Christ. So he got that out of the way right away. And they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? He said, I am not. Are you the prophet? That goes back to Deuteronomy 18. They were looking for the prophet. Uh, and he answered, no. They said to him, who are you? So that we may give an answer to those who have sent us. What do you say about yourself? I mean, how do you describe what you're doing? How do you describe your ministry? See, these are not threatening questions. They're inquisitive questions at this point. Listen to what he says in verse 23. What he says in verse 23 is a quote. If you have your Bible there, notice he is quoting Isaiah 43, 40 verse 3. I'm in John 1, 19 through 34. I'm in verse 23. He said, I am a voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet said. And the word Lord here, they understand. We talked about this the other day. They're understanding that he's talking about the Lord here. He's talking about the Messiah. That's what John is talking about. And then verse 24, now they had been sent from the Pharisees. They ask, and if you've kept up with the questions, you, we're, we're now down to the last question. They asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if? Notice the why and the if. That if is a first class condition. If, if you say that you're not Christ, nor Elijah, nor the prophet, then why are you baptizing? We don't get it. We're, we don't get why you're baptizing. If we, we can't, we don't get it. Verse 26, John answered them saying, I baptize in water, but among you stands one whom you do not know. John knows that once he, his, once God says, I want your ministry to begin, now, how long do you suppose John has known that he had this special call in his life? Yeah, right out of Luke 1. I mean, his dad. Um, but he's not told, when he's told, go start preaching and baptizing, the, when the Lord says start now, he was preaching but when he says, I want you to go. I want you to start baptizing. The Messiah is ready to come. I mean, he's on, he's he he is here. You understand? He's here. He's full, full grown and ready to go. This is what he's saying. They asked him and said, then why do you baptize? John answered, I baptize in water. But among you stands one whom you do not know. Now. Pay attention to this because he's going to say, and I don't either. And the truth of the matter is he's going to say, nobody's going to know, not even myself, until I baptize him and it's revealed to me and it'll be revealed to you. It is he who comes after me, the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. That's a servant's role. 
That's a servant's role. And, and he's talking about rank and authority and where, where he fits in that. Because everybody's come to John because, listen, they all believe John is a national prophet. A national prophet to Israel. These things, then there's a footnote in verse 28. These things took place in Bethany beyond Jordan. This is not Bethany where Lazarus and Mary and Martha lived. This is on the <coughs> east side of the Jordan River, and we're not sure exactly where that place is today. But we know it's on the east side, not the west side. This is not the Bethany uh, that's in the that suburb of Jerusalem where Lazarus and Mary and them came from. They're, that's called Bethany too, but that's not the same one. And then we have a diary the next day. He saw Jesus coming to him. This is the next day after this interview. And, and, and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That's very famous, ain't it? And you know what happened here? He got tagged with this. Uh, this is a doctrinal title given to John to give to Jesus. And listen, this is gonna this is gonna attract Jesus from this point. This is the beginning of his ministry, all the way to the end of the book of Revelation. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb that was slain, and His blood, right, fills up the book. I mean, it's all over from this point to the end of the New Testament. This is going to be a doctrinal thesis idea. Okay. Well, let's see. Behold the Lamb of God. Verse 30. This is he on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who has a higher rank than I. That's untying the sandals business. Listen, for he existed before me. Well, there's a revelation because John is how much older than Jesus? They're cousins. Six months. Six months. See, that's preexistence. That's preexistence of Christ idea. That's theology right there. Now watch verse 31. I did not recognize him. That, that is Messiah. I knew Jesus, but I didn't recognize him as Christ. I knew Jesus. But I didn't, I didn't recognize him as Christ. In order that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptizing in water. The reason John came baptizing in water to, was to reveal what Jewish male that was committed to the coming of Messiah would be, who, who, who the Messiah would be. John didn't know. And, it, and, and this Messiah, which was living among Israelites at that day, they didn't know either. I did not recognize him. John bore witness. There's our word used three times now, 1934 and 32. John bore witness saying, I have beheld the spirit descending as a dove out of heaven, and he remained it remained upon him. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descending and remain, it's got to have two parts, and remain upon him, this is the one who baptizes in the Holy Spirit, which is a whole new idea here. And I have seen and have borne witness that this is the Son of God. And so he's given him another doctrinal title. And the, what is interesting about this, now, who does the, we know the Lamb of God, Jesus represents the Lamb of God. Who represents the dove? How do we know that? Because Scripture says so, right? Right? Well, well, but look, we're reading the Bible, so we want to be sure it is the spirit that descends like a dove. Behe I beheld the spirit descending 
as a dove, like a dove of heaven, and it remained on him. And that's exactly what the Lord told me he had to do. You're going to see it. It will be like a dove. It will be in a bodily, you will see him like in a bodily form. He will look like a dove as you understand what a dove looks like. And listen, this doctrinal emblem, the lamb got attached to Jesus and the dove got attached to the Holy Spirit in the church age, didn't it? If there's two things, it's all about one's, the, the lamb of God is all about Jesus and the dove is all about the Holy Spirit, isn't it? These, these are emblems that have just stuck. And they came from this passage. This is where they come from. And so he says, I, I have seen and I have borne witness that this is Son of God. So we're going to break this down today and we're going to take a look at this after a word of prayer. I give you a moment of silence. I believe priest, classroom etiquette. Be sure your cell phones are off and all that type of stuff. And, uh, and then prepare your own soul for the study of the Word of God, that God can reveal things to your life tonight, both, both on a biblical history point, but also on how this applies to my life. The Lamb of God and the Dove of the Holy Spirit. And, and this whole experience. In order for that to happen, of course, you can't study the Bible in carnality. You need to confess your sin. It could be mental attitude, sin, sin, the tongue, revert sins. And what I say to my people sitting here or the people in Bible study before me tonight, I say to those on the Internet, this protocol or this etiquette of classroom is for you as well. Mental attitude, sin, sins of the tongue, overt sins should be confessed in silence. According to 1 John 1, 9, it's, an, it's a for sanctification, the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the teaching hour. 1 John 1, 9, if I confess my sins, he's faithful and just to forgive me and to cleanse me. Father, we're so thankful for these that have come our way to study with us by automobile and by internet. I pray the Holy Spirit would minister the truth of the word of God to our souls tonight. Not just on history lesson, not just on a biblical lesson, but in a practical application to this whole thing. Br bring it into the reality of our life. This became what John experienced, not, not, not just, but he, God revealed through teaching him the word of God what to look for and then brought it all to pass in his life. And the witness became his testimony. And his testimony was that Jesus of Nazareth was the Christ, was the Savior of the world. What a phenomenal idea. We've made our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll look at uh, four baptism. We'll look at John's baptism of Jesus. We'll look at Jesus' baptism of death. We'll look at Jesus' baptism of the Holy Spirit. And we'll look at uh, Jesus' baptism of fire. These four baptisms of Jesus will uh, cover, uh, will cover, not over, but will cover the period from the first advent to the second advent of Jesus Christ. It begins with the baptism, uh, John baptizing Jesus in water of the Jordan, and then we'll wind up with Jesus doing the whole thing. So we'll, we'll look at that over the month of November. Today I want to look at Wow, I just have three, three, <laughs> three aspects of John's baptism of Jesus recorded in our lesson text, which is John 1, 19 through 34. Uh, point number one, today's lesson opens with John uh, and the wa and water baptism of Jesus. It opens um, with him being a witness, as I mentioned ahead of time, what he witnessed has now become his testimony. It opens, it says, look in verse 19, uh, John witnessed, and then in verse 34, that witness became his testimony. And you'll see the difference because when you get down to verse 34, they're going to be in the perfect tense. And that makes a big difference. The thing that's of, of interest to us as Bible students is that the Pharisees, they're, in, they're just in an investigative uh, 
posture, wanted to know what John is doing out there in the wilderness, baptizing with water. Um, and so they sent uh, some Levites and priests out there to ask him to gather uh, the information of seven questions. There's one question in 19. There's three questions in 21. There's two questions in 22. And there's one question in 25. This is, they're curious about what he's doing. Everybody is in agreement, it seems to be, all the way through the scriptures, that they're, they're confident that John is a national prophet to the people of Israel. What they don't know is why he's baptizing. Because what was happening in his baptism is that people were being separated. There was a group being formed. The bat, the, the, wasn't so much his preaching, it was his baptism. And it was, I mean, when you read the synoptics, that's Matthew, Mark, and Luke. When you read this account in those three books, you can see that John was preaching a whole lot of stuff. This just focuses on the baptism. They were more interested. They checked him out apparently theologically and didn't have any problem with him. But what they're interested with is baptism because he's baptizing people and he has, the, the, the Pharisees look like there's something started here, a movement, because they're being grouped. The, the, those that John baptized feel that they're special. And, and, of course, they are. And he doesn't baptize everybody who comes and requests it by coming to John and requesting it because many came to John and requested baptism, and he ran them through a little John the Baptist test, and many of them didn't. And, again, you can look in the synoptics account of this, and you can see. And he refused baptism. So, I mean, you, and we'll talk more about it, but. Um, so they're curious about this because it seems that, that there is a movement starting here. And, and really there was, wasn't it? Because he was calling a group of people out for the coming of Christ, a welcome committee, people that uh, had go th gone through John's screening test on this deal. And, and, uh, and they're, they're, they're worried about it. They think John's okay. Not quite sure where did he come from? Who is he? All of a sudden, he just shows up and he starts preaching and everybody goes like, he is a definite prophet. And listen, they haven't had a prophet in Israel for 400 years. But they haven't had a Messiah ever. So, <laughs> Well, he's told them in this, uh, through the questioning, they, he said, I am not Christ, I am not Elijah, and I'm not the prophet. They, so they were pretty familiar with some of the top people connected with the coming of Christ, weren't they? They didn't understand the difference between the first coming and the second coming, but they, they did have the right players in the coming of Christ. And that's, that's interesting uh, to me. And so they asked him a really, what I thought was kind of an interesting question when he go, they go through, are you Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. Are, are you the prophet? I mean, they've gone through all the big guys, and he's gone, no, no, no. Then they go, well, then how do you describe yourself in your ministry? Which is a fair question. Um, what do you say about yourself then? I mean, you got this ministry going, and boy, he did. I mean, he, he didn't do any street preaching. It was He went to the wilderness, and the people came to him. But he's out in the wilderness. And, a, and large groups of people are coming to him, and a large number of people being baptized because they go through his, through his screening test. You couldn't just get baptized out there just because you showed up. He wasn't running numbers. Maybe it wasn't running numbers. Uh, John, answered, uh, John answered the six questions by quoting 
let, let, let all six of these questions, when he gets to verse 23, six of these questions are now, go, now going to be wiped right off the sheet. What, what do you say about yourself? And your, who, who are you and what is your ministry about? If you're, if you're not Christ and you're not Elijah and you're not the prophet, then who are you and what are you doing with you in this ministry? We, we don't know. And he, said, and he quotes Isaiah 40, verse 3. He said, I am a prophetic voice. I am the prophetic voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make, stray, make straight the way of the Lord. I am not the Christ. I am the heralder of his coming. And he is here somewhere. And then he's going to explain why he baptizes with water. Okay. John is declaring himself to be a national prophet to Israel after 400 years of silence. That's not John's 400 years, but Israel's. John answers the seventh question. Look at the seventh question, verse 25. In verse 25, they asked him and said to him, why then are you baptizing if you're not these people? See, now he told them who he was. They asked him who he was. And they asked him and said, we still don't get it. If you're not Christ and you're not that, yeah, 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 then why are you baptizing? They still haven't. I'm the, I'm the prophetic voice of Isaiah 40 verse 3, right? I am, I am baptizing. I am preaching and baptizing to make straight. And, and look at that's an imperative. Look, he's under command. Look at that made straight is an aorist act of imperative, second verse plural. Uh, aorist act of imperative. Make straight the way of the Lord. Make straight the way of the Lord. Now, then he's going to get from verse 25 through 27, he's going to launch into this. That's going to be very important to us. But before I get there, look. It's very important that you know the background to John's statement of Isaiah 40, verse 3. The background to the confidence that John has that he is the prophet, he is, he is the fulfillment of the prophet of Messiah in Isaiah 40, verse 3. His background comes from the prophecy given to Zechariah, his father, who was a priest. Now, remember the two groups that have come to interrogate John the Baptist, the Levites and the priest. Well, listen, his father was one of this group of people. And John was born into that, but became the prophet. Right? I mean, John, you know, it's heritage. It, you inherit this. Um, background to John's statement uh, regarding the birth Luke 1, and this is well worth your read later, Luke 1, 11 through 17, and then Zechariah's prophecy. In other words, this in Luke 1, 11 through 17, Gabriel gives this to Zechariah about, about the child that's going to be born. You know, it, you know the background of that story. Then, but listen, what, what's also important is at the circumcision ritual of John, right? You know, the eight-day deal. He gives this long prophetic message. And you should pay attention to verse 76 through 79. And so this is the background. His father, a priestly servant of shadow Christology, has well indoctrinated him so that when he is ready to go into ministry, he knows who he, what, what his role is. That's pretty, that's pretty phenomenal. And, and it was prophetic uh, early on. And so th the background to this helps you understand because I know when I first heard this story, I thought, well, how did John get all that? And, and uh, you know, like most of us, good training on the front side and then the Lord speaking to him directly on the back side, right? Like, mo like many of you, not me, but like many of you. Uh, Notice, no, notice again, I want to remind you that this thing opens with the word testimony or witness and closes with that same word. 
Notice in verse 34 when it closes that the word I have seen is a perfect tense and the word I have testimony is a perfect tense. That's because of everything that transpired in his life through 19 through 34. Okay? Listen, that, isn't that true for all of us? Um, we need a, a witness of confidence and the Father give it to us. We cycle that through the faith cycle. We, faith, we you know, inhale, exhale it. It becomes a base of faith in our life and it becomes our testimony, not our witness. It's not a witness involved between God and me, but of truth. But now it becomes a solid testimony of the absolute truth. That's what's happening in his life. Uh, this is what should be happening in our life every time we come to Bible study. The processing should be going on in our life. It should be I come in and here and then I leave it. I mean, that's not what the Word of God, that's not power of the Word of God. I mean, if that's happening in your life, you're missing the purpose of the word of God being taught to you. It should be cycled through your life. I mean, and listen, if it is, then transformation to that truth should be going on in your life. You, I say this all the time. You should not be the same person you were yesterday. You should not be the same person you were a week ago. You should not be the same person, spiritually speaking. Because transformation, if you're, if you're studying the word of God and cycling that, listening to the word, studying the word, believing upon it. You don't have to bleed everything upon it to get transformation, but you have to believe something on it, right? I mean, how much you know is based on how much you've grown. But transformation be go should be going on in your life. I mean, it's a measuring stick for me. I, mean, I, I don't need to have my wife tell me that. I don't need to have my children tell me that. I don't need to have my church tell me that. Listen, I tell myself that every day. I mean, I have the measuring stick in my life. I mean, I know if I'm doing well or not, even if other people, people, other people might misread me. I, I don't misread myself, and certainly the Holy Spirit, when he speaks to me, I don't misread it. I don't think I'm any different than anybody else about this idea. In fact, one of the things about spiritual maturity that excites my soul is that growth. The, the ability to handle things I never could handle before. And as if, and it's not because I don't care. It's that I understand how it works. Where before I might be a nervous wreck or I might do this or I might do that. I don't do that anymore. And I don't make everybody else do it. I'm just saying... That's transformation of my life, and nobody knows it better than myself. I know when I'm a phony baloney and when I'm not, right? Don't take long with somebody who really likes you or knows you well to know whether you're a phony baloney. I don't know what phony baloney was because baloney was phony to me, <laughs> right? Steak, a steak sandwich is what we had for several years, Dylan, I don't know. Now, listen to this. Now, here's, what I, here's where I want you to go with me tonight in this study. Point number two, John will give four prophetic testimonies. This is so important. People just do not understand John's baptism. And so they get nutty in a fruitcake about baptism. John will give four prophetic testimonies to Israel, to Israel, identifying Jesus as Israel's Messiah in our lesson text. I mean, clear as a bell. And here's a, the four testimony John give, because remember, it opens with a testimony, closes with one, and there's four in it that make this thing work. And I broke this down, verses 19 through 23, there's the first testimony. 24 through 28 is the second testimony. Uh, 29 through 31, I'm in chapter 1. 29 through 31 is the third testimony. And the fourth testimony uh, down there is going to come, well, let's say 32 through 34. Are you with me? See it on your paper? Yeah. All right. It's important because he, 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 he starts with a witness and he concludes with a great testimony. And these four testimonies developing, there's a, the first one comes in and then a second one comes in and a third one and a fourth. And is their building blocks to get to verse 34. 
Okay? John confesses in verse 19. John confessed. Remember that word is used twice. The word confessed is used twice. Uh, homologeo. Uh, that, and you know, that means to agree with the truth that God has established in you. Right? The word confess, that's what that means, homologeo. John confessed that he is the national prophet to Israel by fulfilling Isaiah 40, verse 3. And listen, he said, well, they ask him, they ask him seven questions. And he says, well, here's your answer. Isaiah 40, verse 3. And he quotes it. Now, he could have stopped right there and said, what do you think? Because you know what they did? They went a pretty good distance from Jerusalem, from the city, all the way to the Jordan, crossed over the Jordan into a desert. I said, no McDonald hamburger places. No, none of that fast food stuff. You better take your sack lunch. If you don't have one, there'll be a little boy. The, you can try your magic with it. You know what? You know the proof of the pudding that he's Isaiah 40, verse 3, because they've went out to willingness to hear him. Listen to what he said. He says, I don't know, somewhere in here. I am the voice, I am the prophetic voice is what he means. I am the voice, the prophetic voice of Isaiah 40, verse 3. That's the prophetic voice. I am the prophetic voice of one crying in the wilderness. <laughs> Look, where am I? What am I doing? And what do I tell everybody who comes? Make a straight path for the Lord is coming. What are you doing out here? I'm gathering a welcome committee. I'm waiting on a signal that the Lord has come. And I will know it and I will tell all of Israel who it is. He's already here, but we don't know who it is. I mean, I mean, he could have said, look, where are you? Where are you right now? Well, I'm in a desert. I mean, is it a little desert or a big one? No, we had to walk all the way, cross a river, swim. You know? <laughs> I don't know. I'm all dirty, dusty. I'm not going to eat what you had, locusts and honey. I can tell you that right now. I'm not into bugs no matter how you cook them. And the, the, so I'm a voice of one crying in the wilderness. This word crying is B-O-A-O. -O. Did I write that on your paper? No. Nah. It's B-O-A-O. -O. And, it, and it's a, a loud voice. You know, they didn't have PA systems back there, Kenny. No PAs, man. He's out there in the wilderness. I guess there's probably some echo out there. Depends on where the mountains are, I guess. But it didn't matter because he had a loud voice. Because this means a loud voice. I am a prophetic voice shouting in the wilderness. What am I shouting? Make straight. And it's a command. I've been commanded to tell you to make straight the way of the Lord, as Isaiah the prophet has said. <laughs> Jeez. I mean, the proof's in the pudding. You're standing right here, and I'm doing this. <laughs> I love that. I mean, John, you're so good, John. John explains who he was not. In verses 19, 22. And then he explains who he was in verse 23, right? I am not Christ. I am not Elijah. I am not the prophet. But I am the voice of Isaiah 40, verse 3. 
I am the prophet shouting for all of Israel to know that the Messiah is on his way. He's already here. The second testimony of John is in verses 24 through 28. 24 through 28. John the Baptist responds to their final question, which was, why are you baptizing if you're not? See, what is really interesting, most of us would say it different. We would say, if you're not Christ, and if you're not Elijah, and yeah, then, then why are you out there doing what you're doing? That's not how they did that. That's not, that's not how this went down. And so that's kind of important. This is not the way it went down. It went down this way. It went down this way. Why are you baptizing? See, that's, that's the main thing. I can't go back unless I get that information. Of all the questions, that's the main question because it appeared to the Pharisees that a movement was happening. A movement. Right? And we need to get to the bottom of that. And it's something connected because every time somebody gets baptized, then they get a, a welcome Jesus sign and they carry it around. And there's T-shirts now being made and, and this thing's getting out of hand. <clears throat> and the prophet, if you want to know more about that, you can study, put this down, cut it and put it on your paper. If you're interested, you don't have to, if you're not interested, but I am taking notes on you. <laughs> it's part of my testing uh, Deuteronomy 18 15 through 18 uh, Deuteronomy 18 verses 15 through 18 and then you want to look at because it's going to be mentioned again in Acts 322 and in Acts 737 that'll give you background to it um this baptism was, was, was appearing to the Pharisees that a movement was on hand, and they didn't know why. But it was connected to John. It was connected to baptism. And somehow or another, like I said, when they, <laughs> when they came out of the water, they were accepted and given this sign, Jesus is coming, or Christ will be here in a, I don't know. But they're, they're, they're concerned. John answered them saying, I baptize in water. Watch, watch this now. Watch this now. Did you know John's three answers given to this question? There's an A, B, and C. You know, for A, you're adorable, and B, <laughs> you're so beautiful. He said, I, in I baptize in water first. But among you stands one whom you do not know. I mean, he's already here. You do not know who he is. That's uk oida, perfect tense. But he's already here. There's one who already stands. Streckel. That's perfect tense too. That's, as, as, it's just interesting how some Greek words, that's histomy, became streckel because it's in the perfect tense, became a word of its own like Oida, which is from whole rail. It's just kind of interesting. No extra charge for that. The second thing, what's the second thing? The second thing, it is he who comes after me, the lungs of which sandals I am not worthy to untie. Listen, the second one is he who comes after me, and the third one is the thongs of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. See those three things? Those are really important to John. It's important to John. Three things. He's already here, but I don't know who it is and neither do you. Number one. Number two, he who comes after me, you know, and he's already said he who comes after me existed before me. And, he, and they know he's talking about Christ. And then he, he puts, I'm not worthy, which is that, 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 that the person I'm looking for is superior in rank. 
to the national profit. Whoa. The superior in rank to the national profit, right? Is that not what John said? I'm not making that up, am I? Okay. Later, he's going to say that just in case you thought it was. So why is he baptizing? See, that's his answers to him. In the third testimony of John, found in verses 29 through 31, notice the, ne the word the next days. Do you see that? Verse 29. Is it verse 29? Next day. Now, now watch this. I want to show you something. We're always looking for markers, are we not? I found questions what were important, right? There's markers. But look at this. Look at verse 29. Look at verse 35. Look at verse 43. You know what he's got? John has got a diary going. I'm not talking about John the Baptist. I'm talking about John the writer. John the writer is writing this. Right? He's got a diary. This is why I have one. It's because of this. And then when I, when, once I realized this, I found that a lot of guys in that did it. Paul did it. That's how he could bring all that stuff back up to you. And I, I started doing that. Uh, my son-in-law, Dave, I mean, I do it generally. He started doing this. Somewhere in grade school. <clears throat> and it's the darndest thing you ever seen. And he is really good at it now. I get my tips from him. But, but buddy, I'll tell you, every day he closes down with the Lord on that book. It, it's a, uh, well, anyhow. And I'll tell you why these are markers. Let me show you why they're markers. This thing starts in 19, goes through 28. That's, for, that's the first day mentioned, right? And then the next day starts 29 through 34. And then the next day is 35 through 37. And the next day is 43 through 51. You know what I just did? I used them as markers. If I was going to teach that, I would break those down, which I already did, didn't I? I broke that thing down in the first two. I broke them down 19 through 34. I call them markers. I don't, for me, they're markers. They're very important. It tells me a lot about the man who's writing the book, too. Really early in the book, you're going to find him do this a lot. So it, it, it's kind of good to have a heads up, and, and then it kind of gives you a way he writes. So it helps you. Understand it the way he writes. Um, I mean, I'm at number three. Uh, notice the next day is referring to after the six questions were answered. Look, look, you missed that. When we get to the next day, it's a reference to having the six questions answered. And then you know what happens next? What's your Bible? You, you in verse 29, looking at 29, 30, 30? You know, you know what happened next? Jesus comes to him. The next, the next day. Da, 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 da. The next day. The next day. After he's told the officials, you understand? The next day. And I love this. See, see the word John saw? What, I don't know exactly how it says. Where am I, 30? 29. Um, verse 29. The next day he saw Jesus coming to him. I love this. Now watch this. Now, now, now look. They're all different kinds of words for see in the Greek. Seeth, okay. King James? Yes. Seeth. 
What's the same word in it? Yeah, it's the same word. It's just old English. Um, oh, there are different words. You got me distracted. <laughs> There are different words for sea. I mean, there's a, if, if, you know, if you just take a little vines and look up that, I, I don't know, there's probably 12, something like that. I mean, that was a lot. And they're all uniquely interesting. And if he was a lawyer, you'd have to learn all of them if he was a lawyer. As a preacher, it's good to know some of them. This word that's used here is blippo. Yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. Blepo. Is it? Yeah. And here you go with it. Here you go with it. Here you go with it, which means to see with the eye. B-L-E-P-O. Blepo or blepo. It is, it is the word. Okay. He sees with the naked eye. He sees it with his eye, not with his mind. And I can't tell you how important this is. You'd have to read Matthew's account and Mark's account and Luke's account to understand how important this is, the blippo. Look, look, here's what he sees. He sees Jesus coming to him, and he goes like, I wonder why he's here. I'm telling you the truth. I wonder why he's here. I didn't expect to see him here. Listen, and he's really going to have his world rock when Jesus said, I come to be baptized. And John's going to go like, whoa. I don't think so. No, John's going to tell him that. Which is a whole nother story in itself. Right? And, it, and you have to understand what John required of people to understand why he questioned why Jesus would come to him. And he says, look to Jesus. If you need it, then I need it too. Right? Baptism, repentance of the forgiveness of sins, right? They said to Jesus, I know. It's just interesting. We, we, we'll do another study on this. I can see that right now. There's too many questions in your eyes. He sees Jesus coming and Jesus says to him, and John says to him, John says to the people, John says to the people, watch verse, watch the next three, three parts. John says, behold, the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and it becomes a doctrinal title, the lamb of God. Behold. The Lamb of God. Now, what you don't realize is the conversation that's gone on with him, between him and Jesus, which Matthew records. A, quite a conversation. This is he on, on behalf of whom I said, after me comes a man who is higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Listen to what John says. I, 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 I didn't recognize him. I Man, I know who Jesus is, but I never knew that Jesus was the Christ. I didn't have a clue. Isn't that interesting? Listen, it's a very strong statement. He uses, I did not recognize as he uses the strong negative, ook, not me, uses a strong negative and oida in the perfect tense. I've known Jesus all my life. I had no clue that he would be the Messiah. Yeah, I know. Well, you would have thought so, wouldn't you? You would have thought so. Sure wasn't there. But Jesus hasn't had any ministry at all, right? His ministry, he's about 30 years of age, right? And his ministry is just now going to kick off. So John has had no, no reason to think because he's not seen anything other than family reunions or whatever they have. 
maybe going, maybe seeing each other when they go to festival times, right? Some of the holiday things. But listen, he's going to say this twice. He's not going to say this once to these people. He's going to say it twice. I did not recognize him, but so that he might be manifested to Israel, I came baptized in water. This is the second time he's told him that. He, do, he did this up in 26, 27 in the second testimony. I didn't know him. There's one standing among you. I do not wh know who it is. Jesus shows up and he goes like, I wonder what he's doing here. And then she says, I'm going to be baptized. You go like, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Whoa. And listen, here's what's important about this one. I came baptizing in water. That word baptizo is a present act of participle. And it's a reference to ritual baptism. For the purpose of identifying the person of the Messiah. That's a participle. It's a very important participle. I mean, the, he knew he was coming. But he didn't know who it was. And his job was to identify the person. So he, I mean, he only baptized males, Jewish males. And they had, to, they had to qualify. And when Jesus come, Jesus already qualified. He go, like, All right. And there's a whole discussion that goes on between these two. And I think it's Matthew that records it. Third yeah, the third chapter. Um, that, that, and it, but he says, but so that he, so that he, and that, that word so that is hina plus a subjunctive, and it, it's a divine purpose. And, and that was the calling John had and the reason he baptized in water. That is exactly the reason. It was for no other reason. That he might be manifested to Israel, heiress passive subjunctive. The fourth testimony is a powerful declaration, uh, uh, declaration uh, of John to Israel in verses 32 through 34. In this passage, we learn two really important things. We know something about the Holy Spirit here that John reveals to us. And we know something about an additional ministry of Jesus called the baptism of the Holy Spirit, which is very important to the church. And so he says, John testified saying, I have seen, and he uses a different word. Now he's used blippo, he's used horeo, he's used horeo a lot, which is the mind, in, the mind contacting the information, processing, the mental processing. And now he uses a word that, um, uh, that caught, where you have to um, really pay a lot, you have to really focus and pay attention in order to see the processing that's going on. You've got to be able to think and, and concentrate in order to process what's going on. That's this word here. I have seen, that's it, and it's a perfect tense. And this is why John had been told ahead of time that when he baptizes one day to identify the person the Father is going to send the Holy Spirit that's going to appear to you like a dove in a bodily form like a dove. And he will descend out of heaven and he will remain on that person through the entire baptism. And that's who you will declare is the Messiah. Okay? So what he's talking about here. When he says, I have seen in the perfect tense, I, I had it. I mean, I knew what I was looking for, but I, I probably baptized a thousand people. I don't know. I'm just, you know, I baptized a whole lot of people looking. Nope, nothing, nothing. And after probably after a while, you just kind of like, man, here we go. You know, here we go. If you ever had one of those jobs where it's just, uh, yeah, yeah, you sleep and just pass, pass the ammunition, whatever. Well, but. His attention has been turned different. First of all, when he saw Jesus show up, and then when Jesus said, I come to be baptized, I mean, his whole 
world kind of went, whoa, 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 whoa. And, um, and, the, and then, then he, and the, so he baptized and they, he's really awake on, on top of his game here. And then he sees it, he sees it in a panoramic theater. It's like, you know, it's like some of those things in our life that go slow motion and technicolor. That's what John saw. He, it was like the, 3D theater for him. I have seen the spirit descend as a dove out of heaven and remained upon him. And you know what's interesting about the lamb and the dove? Now we got two members of Godhead. <laughs> we got two members of Godhead here. The one thing John does not record that's famous about the baptism of John, of John over Jesus is the voice out of heaven. This is my, be and who I, my beloved son whom I was. John doesn't record that at all. It, and I'm surprised he missed that because that puts all three members of the Godhead at the baptism, and that's a big deal. Anytime you find three members, and they all had a specific role. They all did something. They didn't just show up. They all had an active role. Um, and it, it kind of surprises me that John didn't mention that. All, all the others did. All, every synoptic writer... You know, this baptism mentioned all four gospel, which is rare, too, to have something like that. And then for John not to mention, I don't know. You know, it's not mine to say, but it's a, I go like, whoa, how come we didn't? We, we could have wrapped this thing up really sweet. The, the thing about a lamb and a dove, both were used in, in, in sacrifice for sin, right? The dove was used for what? The poorest. So that nobody was excluded. The lamb and the dove, uh, bo both ends of the of the of the sacrifice was covered. Isn't that interesting? In other words, this, I mean, you got the lamb and the dove, man. Oh, this is too good to be. I mean, you, you could make this stuff up, could you? And once again, he says, "I did not recognize him." Look at that. That's the second time you said this. I did not recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descend and remain upon this. Now watch this. He tells him something additional. He, this, he tells him something he did not know, right? He says, this is the one, listen, I didn't recognize him, but he who sent me to baptize in water said to me, he upon whom you see the spirit descend and remain upon him, this is the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. This time when he uses the word see the Spirit, when, said to me, he upon whom you see is horeo. This is the one who will baptize in the Holy Spirit. Wow. I mean, this is quite a day. <laughs> this is quite a day. And then John concludes, I myself have seen, he uses horeo in the perfect tense, and have testified, perfect tense, that this, this one, that this one, uh, Jesus of Nazareth, is the Son of God, and throws another title on him, puts another title on him, that's going to hang with him all the way through, puts the title on him, boy, the Son of God. Now, the other ones have the voice saying it. This is how this came down. Um, let me let me close by asking a question, and we'll leave. Here's what I thought about. First, that I think was important for John. No. Do you know? Do do we know? I'm saying we. Do we know who we are in Christ? I mean. I mean, do you know who you are in Christ? I mean, that's very important. This was just essential to John. And when they came out, they wanted to know. We, they wanted him to answer these kind of questions. If you look back at those questions, are you the Christ? Who are you? Are you the Christ? No, I know who I am. I'm not Christ. Uh, are you Elijah? No, I know who I am. In, I know who I am. No, I know who I am in the plan of God. John wouldn't have said in Christ. He would have said in the plan. Do you know who you are in the plan of God? Well, 
No. Are you Christ? No. Are you Elijah? No. No, but I know who I am, right? Are, are you the prophet? No, but I know who I am. Well, then just who are you? I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. I am the prophetic voice for Christ of Isaiah. So what I got out of this lesson for me, do you know who you are in Christ? Do you know who you are in Christ? Because that's the first essential identity of the importance of who you are in this world in the plan of God. To be able to answer that question. The other question I thought was interesting. Do you know who you are in ministry? Do you, do you know who you are in ministry? Do you know? And who you are in ministry, does it jive with what you think God has said? See, for me, I don't want to go into all about me, but that was a big question for me. It was a tough one to answer because I didn't want what I knew he wanted me to do. I didn't want to do it. I didn't want to do it. But, but I was a coward. I, I, I was too afraid to run like Jonah. So I drove down that mountain. And then, and then one more question. Do you know who you are in your, in a specific ministry of your life? No, I don't, I don't mean, do you, do you know that you have a specific ministry in your life? That's not what I ask you. Right? That's not what I ask you. Do you know who you are? in that specific ministry? Do you know what your role is? Do you know, do you have the confidence that that's what God has placed in your life at this point? See, I think for me, what I got out of this lesson, I thought, okay, other than the great, the great history of it, was the testimony that John bore about his ministry. And so for me, that these were, this was a very important lesson for me. Uh, John went through all those questions and they were all about who are you? Not, not as a person necessarily, but a person in the plan of God. Let's pray. We thank you tonight, Father, for these have come our way to study with us on the baptism of John, looking at his great ministry as the prophetic heralder of the coming of Christ. And it's been a wonder study to look in the life of John. And for me, it's been important to look in my own life. In Christ. In ministry. And whatever else. I pray tonight, Father, as we've looked at John's baptism of Jesus in at least this first encounter with it that we would understand how important the word of God is in our soul and living it out on the daily basis. I mean, here we have two guys in their 30s in great ministry because they know who they are in it and they know their role. John says, listen, I know his, minute, his, his place in the plan of God is superior to mine. I just count it a privilege to be where I am in this role. Uh, we need to be confident and satisfied where we are in our role. John's role was enormous, and yet he saw him not worthy to untie the sandals. He could, he, I, I'm not even, even worthy to be a servant of Christ. And I've been given this awesome task to introduce him to Israel. What an enormous thing that is. This is our prayer tonight, Jesus. And we thank you for it. In your name, amen.